Well, I want to invite you to pull your message notes out. We're finishing this series on legacy. And what I've done last week and what I'm going to do today is very, very different than a typical legacy series. Oftentimes, legacy, we talk about you know, what we give, whether it's uh, you know, our life or our time or our resources. What I really want to deal with is what prevents us from leaving a legacy, because there's some things that, that really stop us. Last week, we dealt with discouragement. When you're discouraged, it's hard to live the life that you're created to live. It's hard to do what God has called you to do when you feel discouraged. Today, I want to deal with a, a really uh, a big one in the world today, and that's depression. When you're depressed, it's hard to live out your purpose. When you're depressed, it's hard to, to be what God has created you to be and to do what God has created you to do. And depression right now is huge in our culture, in our world, in our society. And we need, we need to talk about this. And, and let me just be very, very clear today. Uh, I can't answer everything on this stage. And, and I'm not even going to try to answer it all. But what I want to do is begin a conversation. Because mental illness is very real, depression is very real, severe anxiety is very, very real, and there are a lot of people suffering in secret with these things, and nobody's talking about it. No one's creating a safe place to even begin the conversation. So what I want to do today is not answer everything, but at least begin a conversation, because I met with a number of people in our church this week, people who either suffer with bipolar, depression, severe anxiety, uh, people who have family members or children that are struggling and suffering. And as I listened to the stories, honestly, it broke my heart for what some people have been through and, and even how they've had to, they felt they've had to live in secret for so long and the shame that they carry. And even how the church has contributed to a lot of it, where we've failed in our understanding of this very area. You know, I talked to a guy in our church this week who, who struggles with bipolar, and you know, he talked about how Christmas was always the hardest time for him because of just the anxiety and the fear of being judged, and that I get the right present for everyone, and what are they going to think? He told me a story out in fourth grade. His teacher thought he was stupid. He would never amount to anything and told him he should probably just drop out of school and become a mechanic. I mean, just the shame that he lived with for years just because of some of the, the things. And he said, you know, the problem is when you're physically sick, you can go to a doctor and most of the time they can figure out how to fix you. When you're mentally sick, oftentimes they have no idea what to do. And you have no idea what to do. And you don't even know, know, is this something do I go to a doctor about? Or is this something that I just try to figure out on my own? And, and the other problem is anytime you hear about mental illness in the media or on the news, what is it? It's, it's school shooters or the homeless. And so it creates this shame that if you, if you have a mental illness, if you have any depression, if you have any anxiety, you don't want to tell anyone because they're going to think the worst. They're either going to think you're going to wind up homeless or you're going to you know, go into a school and, and start shooting people. And unfortunately, people are living in this shame and they're living in this secret. And tragically, we're now seeing that there are people, many people who've even chosen to end their life over this struggle and over the shame and, and, and the darkness that they're living in. We saw you know, an anchor on, on one of the news networks this week up in the Midwest one of our staff members had a, a friend from school commit suicide this week. Uh, what really hit home for me was the pastor up in Chino, about an hour north of here, a young pastor, senior pastor of a church just like this, who lived in such darkness that he, he got to the place where he thought the only answer was to end his life, and he left a beautiful wife and three young boys as a pastor. And so I feel like, you know, and let me make a disclaimer, I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm not a professional, I'm not a licensed therapist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I can't prescribe any medication, I am a pastor. But God has given me a voice and God has given me a platform and I, I have to at least begin a conversation. Because there is a part of the issue that is spiritual, and there, there, are, there, there are many elements to this. And so I've got to address the area that God has called me to address and encourage you to make sure you're, you're addressing all of the other areas also. And so what I can do is I can lead you to God. And what God can do is God can heal all things. So let me make some statements to begin with that, that really they just need to be said. Uh, they're just kind of truths in our society today. Uh, first off is 
Absolutely, there is a lot of people who are abusing prescription medication. We, we know that to be the case. There are a lot of people on prescription medication who honestly should not be on prescription medication and are abusing it. So, so that's just the first statement. The second statement is there are a lot of people who absolutely need to be on medication. But because of shame or because of misdiagnosis or because of things friends and family have said to them, and even things that the church has said to them, they're not on medication, and they absolutely should be on medication. And let me just say, if you're not a professional, it's not your place to diagnose somebody. It's not your place to share your opinion. It's not your place to tell your friends or family who should and who shouldn't be if you are not a professional. Because too many of us are misdiagnosing people that we care about, people that we love, and it's just making the problem worse. Now, let me also say, just because a doctor has a degree doesn't mean they have an expertise. And just like if you're going to go in for heart surgery, you get three to four different opinions. When it comes to struggling with something mentally, it's good to get three to four different opinions. Because what I've seen from people that I know and people that I've come in contact with is it's taken them three to four different times before they finally got it right, and before they finally found somebody who knew either the right dosage or the right prescription to deal with what's going on. Let me also say there are many parents who have children who are struggling, but either because of shame or because of ignorance or because of fear, haven't done anything about it. And so all of that is true. So what do we do with it? Well, for me, I was the most insensitive person in this area because I, I, I just didn't get it. You know, when somebody was, I was just like, well, think your way out of it. Just choose joy. I mean, I mean that, like, like what's your problem? Like, like honestly, and if I, if I can get very personal, my wife suffers with severe anxiety. And for years, I didn't get it. And I said some incredibly hurtful and incredibly mean things to her because I just didn't understand what she was going through. I mean, severe anxiety to the point where she had these irrational fears where she didn't want you know, me and my son to leave the house because she was just terrified we were going to get in the car wreck and die. Many of you know my wife from her beautiful voice singing on this stage. She had, at a point, such severe anxiety, she could not sing on stage. She could not sing in front of people. For years, she would never sing in front of people because the anxiety just debilitated her. And when we finally found the right doctor and the right medication, it, she became a different person overnight. Like, it completely changed her. And what I realized through my own story and my own journey of dealing with addiction and having to go to clinics it is the brain is an organ of the human body. And the brain isn't getting the right amount of blood flow. It's not going to work the way it's designed to work. And we don't put any type of stigma on people who are taking heart medication. If your heart's irregular and you need to take medication every day for your heart, no one thinks twice about that. But for some reason, we treat the brain differently when it's, it's an organ. It's no different than the heart. It's no different than the lungs. It's no different from the liver. And if it's not getting the right amount of blood flow, it's not going to work correctly. And my wife's brain wasn't getting the blood it needed to get. And as a result, she was suffering with this severe anxiety. And I was insensitive and didn't understand what was going on. And so we, we've got to get to a place where we can talk about this stuff. Depression manifests in two different types. There's situational depression, what you're going through, what you're struggling with, life events, circumstances. And then there's clinical depression, which is a very... It's a very real chemical imbalance. It's the brain not getting what the brain needs to be able to function the way the brain needs to function. And sometimes they impact each other. Sometimes they follow each other. But it needs to be treated holistically. And, 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 if, it, and if it's a clinical depression, you actually absolutely need professional help. And so let's, let's talk. Let's get a baseline for what depression is. Depression is a mood disorder characterized by anhedonia. It's, it's an inability to, to feel emotions. This was one of my big issues for years. You know, when I was going through my addiction, one of my therapists asked me, uh, when, when you're with your son, do you, act, do you enjoy being with your son or do you just go through the motions of being a good father? And I realized I had no feeling. Because of my addiction, I was, I was kind of a zombie emotionally. I, I was... I was you know, I, I never felt happy. I never felt sad. I was just always just numb. And I realized I didn't, I didn't have an ability to feel. 
Like I wanted to be a good father and I, and I played the part of a good father, but I didn't really feel the joy. Extreme sadness, poor concentration, sleep problems, loss of appetite, and feelings of guilt, helplessness, and hopelessness. Well, I mean, if we could be honest, all of us find ourselves on that list somewhere, at least some point, sometime. I mean, the statistics tell us that mental health struggles are the number one health problem in the world right now. One out of every nine people are on some type of depression medication. One out of every five people have been on some type of medication at some point. Antidepressant usage has gone up over 300% and it continues to increase. I mean, the truth is every one of us get depressed from time to time. The problem is there's the stigma on depression and mental illness. Like if you're physically sick, like if you've got a cold or you've got a flu, no one, no one really thinks different of you. But if you get a, a mental flu, if you get mentally sick, you get a little bit of depression, a little bit of anxiety, people treat it completely differently. They treat you completely, and there's this stigma. And what we have to do in the church, what we have to do is the body of Christ, as followers of Christ, is we've got to get rid of the stigma. We've got to take, in the name of Jesus, we have to take the stigma off of people so that we can create a conversation so that people can begin to talk about what they're dealing with, what they're going through. We, we, need, to, we need to understand it a little bit more. And, and let me make this statement. It's not a sin to be sick. It's not a sin to have a cold, it's not a sin to have a flu, and it's not a sin to have a mental flu, or or to be depressed, or be dealing with anxiety, and unfortunately, this is an area where the church has gotten it wrong for, for a long time. And you need to know that your illness is not your identity. That's not who you are. It's it's just it's something you're going through for a seat, but it's not who you are. And the church can be a very hard place. Partly because when you come to church, for whatever reason, everyone thinks they have to put on a mask when they come to church. Like, I got to show my best. When I, you know, that's why traditionally, like especially in the South, you dress up when you go to church. Like, you got you to put your best foot forward. You got to put your best face on when you go to church. And it's a place where many people don't really feel like they can be real. They can be honest. That's why for us as a church, we're so passionate and committed to small groups because that's, that's the place where you need to take the mask off. The other problem with church is... Uh, Many church people and a lot of church leaders just don't understand. They don't understand what people are struggling with. And and the remedy or the advice they give sometimes just makes the situation worse. Like I heard a story in our community of a of a lady who's struggling with bipolar, got some bipolar symptoms going on, and a group of people uh, didn't really understand the bipolar, what was going on in her life, and accused her of being in bondage to a demon. I mean, can you imagine how hurtful that is? You know, for someone who's struggling with bipolar symptoms to feel like, you know, they're demon-possessed or they're demonized or, let me just say, being bipolar is not the same thing as being demon-possessed. And that may sound funny to hear, but it needs to be said. So to really be a part of our church, for our church to stay healthy, we've got to adopt an attitude that it's okay to not be okay. Like, it really is okay to not be okay. We all got stuff going on. Like, every one of us has issues. Some of us just checked into the hospital a little bit earlier than others, but it's okay to not be okay. Like this, this needs to be a safe place for people. You know, some just hide it a little bit better, but we've got to create an environment where it's normal to express what's going on inside to talk about what you're feeling and what you're going through. So, so what is going on? Well, again, there's clinical depression, there's situational depression. Sometimes they go hand in hand. Sometimes they impact each other. When it comes to clinical depression, there's a very real chemical imbalance that oftentimes has to be treated through medication. But by and large, what we see today is a lot of situational depression. And so I, I just want to help you understand that there's, you know, when it comes to clinical, you need professional help. You need to talk to a doctor. I want to address primarily situational. It'll help the clinical stuff, but it's not the only answer to the clinical. For example, Tim, our worship pastor, uh, he, he suffers with severe depression. I know it doesn't, you don't see it when he's on this stage, but he suffers and he has to take medication. And he honestly, would, he, he would prefer the spiritual to be enough. He would prefer to just do kind of like the Bible steps we're going to talk about today. But he's realized he also needs the medication for this to work. So he actually does both. But I just want to help you understand that, that sometimes it's a combination. 
There's a combination because there's many aspects to who we are. When it comes to, by and large, the majority of depression, situational depression that people are going through, many experts believe it really comes down to a lifestyle disease. We're, we're doing much of it to ourselves. One of the experts on depression in America, Stephen Yardy, in his book, The Depression Cure, wrote, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. But that's the culture we live in. Do you realize the human body was never designed to live this way? Like there's a lot of things we're doing to ourselves because of the way we live our life. We were not designed for this. So let's look at it. On, if it's a disease of lifestyle, let's, let's be honest with it. What, what, what does it really come down to? It comes down to our phones, tablets, and social media. I did some research this week on children who are growing up on technology and are always in front of a screen. They say the amount of time they spend in front of a screen, if it gets to a certain point every day, it actually thins out the, the brainial cortex, and creates possibilities for all sorts of different emotional disorders, social media, people aren't connecting with real people. And now some of the creators of social media are doing these apology tours, talking about, we're sorry, we didn't know this was so damaging. We got all these friends on Facebook, but we don't know how to connect with a real person. We're becoming emotionally crippled as a society. We see it in our lack of identity. People don't know who they are, especially people who are confused sexually. You know, there's a high percentage of of depression and anxiety when when you really don't know who you are. That's why as a church, we're so passionate about discovering your purpose, who God created you to be, who God put you on earth to be. We see in our society today an inability to process pain. We don't know how to handle the hurts of life. We don't know how to handle the traumas of life. So we medicate it all away, either through, you know, binge drinking or binge television, binging on Netflix, binging on pornography, anything we can do to just kind of process the hurt that's going on without actually dealing with it in a healthy way. Big thing in our society today is peer-to-peer mentoring. It's it's no longer older-to-younger mentoring. It's now peer-to-peer. We've got, you know, 15-year-olds getting counsel from other 15-year-olds instead of somebody older in their life. Can I tell you, if I listened to all my 15-year-old friends when I was 15, I wouldn't be your pastor today. I mean, we, we need to get some older people who have some wisdom and have some experience in our lives speaking into us if we're going to succeed. And then finally, this narcissistic, selfie-driven culture that it's all about me. And this amplifies the mental triggers like a hundred times. And it's not just negative, but it's neurochemically altering the brain. I mean, you look at the research amongst teenagers today and, and just the, the way, the amount of likes they get for an Instagram post begins to alter their brain and create anxiety and create stress all about their social media. And then you, you add to the online bullying. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's a recipe for just a, this complete mental health breakdown. And before we get into the Bible, let me address one other area because there, there is a group of people who choose to deal with all of this in a very tragic way. And tragically, many people have chosen to end their life over this stuff. They say in America, over 40,000 people every single year commit suicide. Worldwide, over a million people take their life every year. That's twice the murder rate. Twice the murder rate. Amongst 15 to 24-year-olds, it's the number one killer today. And honestly, as your pastor, I've got to repent for not doing more messages like this because there's a lot of people suffering in secret and we've been silent on this. So let me put it like this. Suicide is a permanent, irreversible attempt to solve a very, very temporary problem. It's a permanent choice to deal with a very temporary feeling. Truth is, most people don't want to end their life. They want to end the pain. Well, I'm here to say you don't have to die to end your pain. Your pain will subside. Your pain is like waves. It comes crashing in, but it'll always recede. No emotion, whether good or bad, will last forever. The pain is not going to last. It's temporary. You know, if you want to read more on this, I would encourage you to read anything of uh, Rick Warren or Kay Warren or any of their blogs, the famous pastor up in Orange County. He had a son a few years ago because of depression, took his own life. 
I was with Rick a few months after it happened and just, just the anguish and the tears and he's just made it a mission to really be a voice on this now. One of the things he always does when he speaks is he always puts up this phone number and he says, listen, if you don't have anyone to talk to, at least call this line because there's people there that will help you. There's people there that will talk to you. And, and I just want to know if, if you don't have anyone you feel like you can talk to, call this number, talk to somebody. And we actually have a church, we have a small group that deals with mental health. So if you are struggling with a mental health issue or you have a family member struggling with a mental health issue, email us and we'd love to get you connected because we have a group and we want to we wanna bring this out of the shadows and begin to talk about it and create a place where it can be addressed. So what does the Bible say? Well, I want you to understand that as a human being, there's three parts. We're body, soul, and spirit. And when it comes to anything, it has to be addressed in all three areas. The body, that's the physical. If it's a clinical depression, then you need to be diagnosed and at times be on the right medication for the physical. Sometimes the physical is just what you eat. It's your diet. It's your lifestyle. It's how you live your life. You know, if it's situational depression, your physical health makes a big difference on your mental health, the way you, the, simply the way you take care of yourself. The soul, soul is therapy, it's counseling, it's being in healthy community, being in the right small group, having people you can be transparent with, and then the spirit, understanding Jesus plus nothing. It's, it's something we talk a lot about as a church, that God is not ashamed of you. If you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with depression, God is not disappointed with you. God is not ashamed of you. God's not holding it against you. In fact, God looks at you the way he looks at his son. Like it's not, it's not Jesus plus you getting it all together and then you're good enough for God. It's Jesus plus nothing. Like you, don't, you don't have to do anything for God to accept you other than say yes to Jesus because it's all about Jesus. It's not about you getting your act together. God loves you exactly the way you are. So what I want to do today is show you the spiritual side because this makes a massive impact. And honestly, it pretty much addresses completely situational depression and it makes a big impact on clinical depression. Now, it's not the only issue in dealing with clinical depression, but it'll absolutely help. But this will deal completely with situational depression. Uh, when you study the Bible, a lot of great men and women in the Bible deal with depression. Jeremiah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, actually wrote an entire book of the Bible on his depression. He actually called it Lamentations, a whole book about depression. And here's what he said. He said, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. I mean, this guy was depressed, depressed. I remember my affliction. That's what psychologists call ruminating. It's just rehearsing the negative. It's rehearsing worst case scenario. It's just over obsessing about the worst thing that could happen. And my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I well remember them and my soul is depressed. Well, obviously. My soul is downcast within me. I mean, if I'm just rehearsing the negative and ruminating about all the bad things that could happen, obviously it's going to lead me into depression. Apostle Paul struggled with depression. I love what Paul says. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed. That, 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 that's a very important word right there. What Paul is saying is the church should not be embarrassed to talk about this because God is not embarrassed to talk about it. He's about to talk about his depression. And he's saying, we don't want you to be uninformed. This is something we need to talk about. This is something we don't need to be embarrassed to discuss. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. We didn't even want to live. It was so hard. So let's begin a conversation as a church. And hopefully, maybe there are people who will get involved in this conversation and not go down a path of, of some tragic, irreversible decisions. I want to look at Elijah. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Elijah was actually one of two people in the transfiguration with Christ in the New Testament. There was Elijah, Moses, and Jesus up on the mountain. I mean, he was a very, very significant carry. Elijah struggled with depression. 
In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah had one of the highest highs in the entire Old Testament, a huge victory. It was a battle between, you know, basically God and, and Baal, the, the prophet of God, Elijah, and all these hundreds of prophets of Baal. And Elijah took an altar and he doused it with water, and whosoever God was real would send fire from heaven and consume the altar. And it was an incredible miracle, and God won, and Elijah won, and he destroyed all of the prophets of Baal. And then the king's wife gets upset, and Elijah falls into depression and he runs for his life, which is very interesting because he hit the lowest of lows right after the highest of highs. Oftentimes, your lowest of lows doesn't come during your lows. It comes right after your high. And that's so true for many people. Right after one of their greatest victories, they fall into you know, the, the deepest lows of their life. So let's look at the story. First Kings 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Ahab was the king, and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So he killed all of Jezebel's prophets. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Elijah, who had been fearless for three years in the face of the king, has now fallen into depression running for his life because of one, one woman, the queen, who threatened him. So I see four causes that led Elijah into this depression. And again, this is situational depression. First, we see is faulty thinking. Truth is, Jezebel wasn't going to kill him by tomorrow, but he's ruminating. He's ruminating. He's just, he's rehearsing the negative. He's just over-obsessing about the worst-case scenario, and it leads him into this depression. I can't tell you how many times I have ruminated over, like, this is the end of the world, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me, and I just, like, over-obsess about this worst-case scenario, only to discover it never happened. I spent all of this energy and all this anxiety and all this depression on something that never even happened. Fear creates a false reality. It's self-talk. And the research has shown us that rumination leads people into anxiety and leads people into depression, and it's very, very unhealthy. And then for some people, they try to drown out the self-talk. They drown out the rumination with with either medicating themselves with drugs or medicating themselves with alcohol or medicating themselves with pornography, many different things. Well, Paul gives us a solution. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, that may be hard when you're depressed. So what I encourage you to do is journal about such things. I mean, physically, make yourself write a list of all the good things in your life. Think about the good things. And the God of peace will be with you. It'll pull you out of depression. The second thing from Elijah's isolation. He left his servant and went off by himself. This is a huge problem. You can be around a lot of people and feel all alone. That's where we're at as a culture right now. And here's the problem when you isolate. When you're depressed, when you're dealing with anxiety, you are the last person in the world you should be taking advice from. (laughs) But that's what we do, isn't it? Like we give ourselves advice when we're in no condition to give ourselves advice. This is why I'm so passionate about every person being in a healthy small group. And it doesn't have to be a small group in our church. It doesn't matter. You just need a group of Christians in your life that you can be honest with, that you can take the mask off with, that can give you some healthy counsel and healthy truth when when, when you're in these positions. Let me put it like this. Small groups is not a luxury. It's a necessity. If you're the only one who knows what's going on in your life, you're in trouble. God never created you to handle this on your own. Ecclesiastes puts it like this. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. And I'm telling you, when you're standing alone, facing depression, facing anxiety, you're going to be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. 
Three are even better. I talked to a psychologist last night who said they've now discovered in psychology that if you have three key relationships in your life, it keeps you emotionally healthy. Three people you can confide in. You need a minimum of three people that you can confide in, that you can be honest with, that you can be transparent with. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. The third thing from Elijah, he's led by his feelings. He's led, he felt like a total failure. He was afraid. He ran for his life. Emotional reasoning always gets you in trouble. See, when you're physically tired, when you're emotionally depleted, your feelings will lie to you. They will misguide you. What happens is we focus on how we feel rather than the reality of the situation, and feelings are highly unreliable. Feelings will hide the facts. Jesus says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Not your feelings. Your feelings will not set you free. The truth will set you free. It's good to share your feelings. You don't repress your feelings. You don't hide your feelings. You get them out, but then you allow God to speak truth, and you allow people who love you to speak truth into your feelings. And then the last thing is comparison. He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. He's comparing himself. I mean, I'm telling you, when you compare yourself, you get depressed. That's that's the problem with social media today. You're comparing like the miserable moment in your life to everyone else's highlight reel. Like, no one takes pictures and puts them on Instagram of their messy kitchen with cereal on the floor and bowls all over the place. Like, no one puts that on Instagram. It's like, we Instagram right after the maid comes, and then everyone can see it, and then you're sitting there, and and can I just be honest with you? Nobody's life looks as good as it does on Instagram. Nobody. Nobody. But we compare. Paul says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, let me give you four things very quickly that Elijah does in this story that pulls him out of it. It says in verse 5, he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. He took a nap. Can I tell you, one of the greatest things you can do in life is take a nap. I mean, taking a nap will help you over so many challenges in life. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat, and then get a good meal. Get some healthy food in you. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate, and he drank, and then he took another nap. I love this. I mean, this is God ministering to him. I want you to relax. I want you to eat some good food. I want you to take a nap. I want you to wake up, eat some more food. Here, take another nap and, and relax. I mean, this is the Sabbath principle. God wants us rested. God understands the power of that in your physical body. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. Like you're not going to be able to face this life if you're not taking care of yourself physically. If you're not, you're not taking care of your physical body. You're not going to be able to get through the stuff that you're going to face. So he got up and he ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went to a cave and spent the night. And if you read the rest of the story, God does this crazy special effects light show with earthquakes and wind and fire. And then all of a sudden, God speaks to him in this voice and gives him some very specific marching orders. And so these final verses, we see four solutions that pulled Elijah out of Depression, and this is for anyone who's at the place where you feel like, you know what, everyone would be better off without me. It's not true. It's not true. Do these four steps. And again, this will cure situational depression. When it comes to clinical depression, it'll be a part of it, but just a part of it. So don't, you know, again, our worship pastor, Tim, he would have loved to just do these four steps, but he realized he needed needed some medication in partnership with these four steps for the clinical depression that he faces. So I just want to be clear with that. First thing is get healthy physically. Your body's part of it. You know, for, for some of us, it's a disease of lifestyle. It's the food we're eating. It's the frenzied pace of our life. It's the technology we're binging on. So we got to get healthy physically. For some people with clinical depression, it's getting the right diagnosis. It's getting the right medication. We've got to get healthy. God wants us to take care of our body. Psalm 127, in vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep. He gives naps to those he loves. <laughs> That's a good word right there. Here's the second. Pour my heart out to God. Elijah, he, sh- he poured his heart out to God. He goes into the cave and he, and he tells God what's going on. And if you read the text, what's very interesting is most of what Elijah told to God was total nonsense. It, it was all untrue. He's, just, he's very emotional, and he's expressing his feelings to God, and his feelings weren't true. 
And what I love about God is God doesn't condemn him for his feelings. God doesn't judge him for his feelings. We need to express our feelings and then allow God to speak truth into us. You don't hide your feelings. You don't repress your feelings. Your feelings are valid. Your feelings are real. We express them, but we don't rely on them because we know our feelings are not truth. We, we, need, to, we need to process our feelings, but we need to let God speak truth into the situation. And again, this is why one of the unofficial mottos of our church is no perfect people allowed. Like, we want this to be a place where you don't have to have it all together. Like, you can be going through some stuff. You can still have some challenges, because that's Christianity. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened and depressed and dealing with anxiety. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to beat you up. I'm not ashamed of you. In fact, I'll give you rest if you come to me. Just bring it all to me. Bring all the baggage and all the emotion and all the feeling to me, and let me give you some rest, and you're going to find some rest for your souls. What you repress becomes dangerous. What you express can be dealt with in a very healthy and a healing way. Third is Elijah experienced the power and the presence of God. I mean, you've got this 3D, you know, special effects, crazy light show God is doing, showing off God's power, and then all of a sudden God speaks to him in this voice. He hears the, it's the presence of God. We work hard as a church to create that for you. We work hard to, to invite the power of God to show up in worship. And that's why I oftentimes in the middle of worship here, you see people start to cry. Why? It's because the power of God, it's, it's overwhelming. And people just, the tears begin to flow. And then in the message, they begin to feel the presence of God. I don't know how many times people have come to me and said, that was exactly what I needed. It was like God was speaking through you right to me. It was the presence of God coming right to my heart. This is what 21 days is all about. 21 days to just kind of get rid of the clutter, get into the presence of God, get into the power of God. We need that. David says in Psalm, be still, comma. Be still, comma, and then you can get to know God. See, some of us are having a hard time getting to know God because we're not being still long enough to spend any time with him. See, when you get still, when you kind of slow down life a little bit, when you kind of get rid of some of the busyness and you start learning the, the, the power of saying no to some things, you slow down a little bit and you get to know God. And I'm telling you, God brings you out of just some crazy messes in our life. And then here's the last one. Let God give my life a new purpose and a new direction. This one on its own it can almost do it by itself. God gave Elijah a new purpose. God said, Elijah, I want you to go down. I want you to anoint this guy to be king. And then I want you to go anoint this person to be king over here. And then I want you to go get your protege, Elisha. And I want you to begin to train him and mentor him because you're about to leave. And I need you to get some stuff done before you go. Can I tell you, nothing brings more meaning to your life than when God says, I have an assignment for you. When you begin to realize that, you know what? My life exists for somebody else's benefit. I don't simply exist for my own benefit. I actually exist for somebody else's benefit. I'm here for a reason. I have a purpose to my life. That alone can pull you out of some stuff. That, that's why as a church, we're so passionate about our growth track and, and the dream team, because we realize it's the best way to pastor you. When we can help you realize that you're here for somebody else's benefit. And you begin to live your life for someone else's benefit. And you begin to realize that God has an assignment for you. And God has a purpose for you. And you're not, I'm telling you. Look what Paul says about it. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. He says, though outwardly we are wasting away. On the outside, we have a lot of drama. On the outside, we have a lot of things that could make us depressed. And, and we could be dealing with some severe anxiety right now. And, and there's just a lot of junk going on in our life. A lot of pain, a lot of heartache. We've, we've gone through a lot of tragedy. Yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Well, how? How can I go through all the tragedy and the pain and the heartache of life how can I go through all of that and yet on the inside continually be renewed? For our light and momentary troubles, so what I'm dealing with, if I'll realize that it really is, as heavy as it feels to you right now, in the scheme of your existence, it's pretty light and momentary because they're achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
In other words, this hurts, but I have something in my life worth more. Like this isn't easy, but there's something I'm living for that is bigger than, than this little situation right here. So yes, it hurts, and yes, it's a struggle, but my eyes are on something else. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen. What is seen will, what is seen will just, just mess you up, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's one of the quickest ways to defeat situational depression, and it'll absolutely make a difference on clinical depression. It's, it's part of it. It's part of the solution. It's not, the, it's not all of it. It's part of it. And this is what happened to me. I dealt with situational depression. You know, after my father abandoned us, I mean, it, it just it ripped my world apart. And for years, I, I medicated it with drugs and alcohol, trying to drown out the pain, drown out the hurt, to the point where I got to a place where I was very, very serious about ending it all. Where I didn't think I could go on. And this one alone pulled me out. Because in the middle of, of the darkest the darkest place that I'd ever gotten to, the point where I was ready to end it all. What God did is he, God showed me a picture of you, to be very honest. God showed me a picture of me standing on a stage like this. I mean, if you would have seen where I was at when God showed me this, like it made no sense. My life wasn't, this wasn't my path. It wasn't even a consideration. God showed me, do me, he showed me me doing this, helping people, giving hope to people, speaking life to people. And I'm telling you, when I began to realize that there was an assignment on my life, there was a purpose on my life, there was a direction for my life, God created me for something, and he, it pulled me out of the darkest place that I had ever been when I began to see what he created me for. And he'll do that for you. He'll give you your purpose. He'll show you what he put you here for. And so the goal of today was to begin a conversation. Let's get honest. Let's get real. Let's start talking about this stuff. There's no shame. Let's, let's get rid of the stigma. Like There's not a stigma when you have the flu or a cold or you're physically sick. Let's not put a stigma on people who have the emotional flu or the, the mental cold or are struggling with a little bit of mental sickness or, or mental illness. Let's understand that there's clinical and there's situational. And if we're not a professional, let's not try to diagnose people. Let's encourage them to talk to somebody who can. And let's do our part and deal with the spiritual. And focus on the spiritual and encourage people to take the steps in the physical that they need to take. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment? Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray for every one of us today, for those that are in the middle of depression, are in the middle of just a very dark season of their life. God, if it's clinical, I pray that you'll guide them to the right doctors, the right professionals that can help them. If it's situational, that you will just give them a revelation of your truth in the middle of their feeling to show them the steps that they can take. If they'll get honest. And I pray that as a church, we would create a safe place for people where people would truly feel it's okay to not be okay and it's not a sin to be sick. And we can talk about what's going on and we can find people we can trust and be transparent with. so that we can get the help and the hope that each of us need. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to close with one song of worship. Our prayer team is going to be available. If this message resonated with you and, and you just need someone to pray with you today, I would encourage you to come forward and let somebody on our team pray with you. Maybe it has nothing to do with the message. You just need someone praying with you today. They are available for you today. I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Let's sing one song together and then we'll be out of here.